Ever since the first video game was created, developers have been striving to innovate their games. The graphics in video games have come amazingly far. The gameplay has more depth than ever before. Games have so much replay value. Stories being told in new and innovative ways. The gaming industry has come a long way. And this innovation has been happening in the industry for basically forever. Before video games even existed, Alan Turing and David Champanown were discussing the concept of computer code that could simulate chess, and ever since, innovation has been the name of the game. But in the last few years, a new form of innovation has come about, something that we hadn't really seen before. In 2019, the global video games market generated an estimated 152 billion US dollars in revenue, which is almost three times movies, with the global box office generating 41 billion. With this insane amount of money being generated by the industry, the mega corporations that own the gaming industry have been hard at work. They've been working towards innovation of a new kind, the innovation of monetization techniques. To be more specific, they are working on trying to make the game's monetization as easy to get into and as addictive as possible. Fortnite's Battle Pass, Hearthstone packs, loot boxes in every game ever made, all of this came about from very clever people figuring out the best way to milk your wallet. There is an arms race taking place. Game developers are using basic human psychology in order to manipulate customers into spending as much money as humanly possible. Free-to-play games need to monetize somehow, so they add microtransactions, things you can buy if you want to, but aren't obliged to. And there's nothing inherently wrong with microtransactions. They are important to a free-to-play business model. But microtransaction systems can be very easily warped and changed into something that isn't there to finance the game, but is instead there to pressure the player into spending money. Instead of making the game as fun as possible and hoping that dedicated players will spend money, they can make it a necessity to spend money just in order to play at a basic level. They can exploit flaws in human psychology to get you hooked on the feeling of spending money. So let's go back in time for a little bit. Free-to-play games have existed for quite a while, and the first real free-to-play games were the MMOs of the early 2000s, and that era was dominated by RuneScape. They monetized their game with content. You could play for free and get the base game, or you could become a member and pay once a month to get extra content that non-members did not have access to. It was an MMO, so the type of person that wants to play an MMO wants to go on an adventure and experience the game, so that was what the paid subscription offered. Either that, or you wanted to progress through the game, getting as high a level as you possibly could, which was another promise made by the membership system. RuneScape members were able to level skills that non-members couldn't level. RuneScape wasn't the only free-to-play game at the time, though. Neopets was another one that existed. In the early days of Neopets, it was just monetized by banner ads on the website, but microtransactions came later. Neopets had a much different demographic, so a lot of things that you could spend money on were cosmetic, appealing to the more social nature of the game. And there's not really anything wrong with this, other than maybe that the target audience of Neopets was quite young and they were selling the microtransactions. But these games were free, and they had to make money somehow, so they did it in a way that would benefit both the players and themselves as much as possible. Now we fast forward to 2007. Team Fortress motherfucking 2 has just been released. The game costs money, about £25 or $30 at the time of release. The game had no microtransactions, the game just cost money. The number of people buying the game dwindled over time and the people who wanted the game had already bought it, and if a game isn't free, but has no in-game microtransactions, that means that long-term players don't make the game developer any money. Only new players buying the game makes them money. But Valve clearly weren't done making content for Team Fortress 2, so in 2011 they made the game free to play, so now they would have way more new players to come try the game, and they would have a way to monetize those long-term players. The way they monetized their game was pretty simple. They had the Manco store. You could buy weapons for about a thousand times the price of what they were actually worth on the TF2 trading economy, or you could buy keys and open crates. Yes, Valve, they created loot boxes for TF2. 
Nobody really bought the weapon bundles and stuff because they're practically worthless. So the keys were the main thing for sale in the store. And this is where things get a little bit questionable because if you really think about it, what actually is a loot box? You pay money and you get a random chance to get a random reward. Good outcomes are rarer than bad outcomes and you almost always lose money. Your reward is usually worth less than what you put in in the first place. It's gambling, right? It's a slot machine. It's a fancy and complex lottery system. And loot boxes are designed this way on purpose. Loot boxes are designed to be random for a variety of different reasons. Simply put, randomness is a good way to make players spend money and to make them spend money more regularly than they would do otherwise. If there's a new hat in the game that you really, really want, but the only way to get it is to buy a chance to buy a chance to roll it in this crate, then you will end up spending a lot more money than if you could just click on the thing you wanted and buy it. And you buy your crates and keys thinking, I might just get the thing I want first try. Maybe it won't take that many attempts to get it. I've already sunk money into it, so I can't stop now. I have to keep spending until I get the thing. This is known as the sunken cost fallacy. It's the idea that if you have already spent money on something, you can't just ditch it or give up because that would mean your initial expenditure was wasted. When, in reality, the initial cost is wasted regardless of whether you keep spending or not. This also plays into something called the gambler's fallacy, which is the idea that the more attempts you make at something, the better your odds are at getting what you want when in reality, your odds per loot box are always the same. For example, if I flip a coin a hundred times and 99 of the times it landed on a heads, the chances that the hundredth coin lands on a tails is still 50-50, regardless of the previous 99 attempt. Loot boxes weren't all that common back in 2011, but Team Fortress 2 really paved the way for loot boxes to become what they are today. So now we fast forward all the way back to 2020 and we talk about the thing that actually made me make this video in the first place. Blizzard are a terrible company and they implemented a battle pass system to Hearthstone and the Hearthstone community is extremely unhappy about it. And for good reason. When the battle pass was first announced, there were inevitable grumbles and groans in the community that things were going to get worse. But the dev team assured the players that they would get more gold and more packs than they used to with the battle pass. And this, it was just a lie. They, they lied. That's not true. You get less for the battle pass. The battle pass is, to put it lightly, a disgusting abomination that was snot rocketed out of a sociopathic marketing team's left nostril in order to make as much money as possible. <clears throat> So they added a rewards track to Hearthstone, an XP system where you can play to unlock free rewards. If you get your wallet out and give the goblins in suits at Blizzard £16.99, pence, you can get extra rewards on your reward track. You also gain a 20% bonus boost in XP to make you progress through the system faster. It's quite a long story, but in short, the new system earns free-to-play players less rewards than they got before. And only if you play for about 10 hours a day do you end up earning the same amount as you used to as a free-to-play player. Hearthstone's in-game economy has always been hideously expensive. If you want to play at a competitive level with all of the classes, you have to spend about 100 quid once every four months just to stay relevant. And the 100 that you spent doesn't even get you all of the cards most of the time. The reason this is an effective business model is because of whales. For the uninitiated, a whale is a business term for a customer who spends a very large amount of money on your product. Blizzard can afford to have 95% of their player base rarely or never spend money if that 5% of their player base spends hundreds and hundreds every four months. And collectible card games have been using this monetization system for literally decades. So when virtual card games rolled about, it was just accepted that it would be just as expensive to own a full collection as it is in Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic the Gathering. But for a very long time, Blizzard has been slowly eking away at the ability to play for free. And this is the most blatant attempt they've ever made at making it impossible to be free to play in Hearthstone. Battle passes in general are a little bit insidious as a concept. 
because the price tag is usually not that high and the amount of content you get is fairly good for the cost, but it's deceptive because despite the good value for money, you have to keep consistently coming back to the game to get your rewards. Instead of just getting what you paid for, the company attempts to form an addiction to the game where you have to come back for a set amount of time per day to earn enough XP to get enough rewards that you already paid for before the battle pass season ends. They keep you hooked in, making sure that when this battle pass ends and the next one begins, you'll spend money once again. And hey, maybe you'll drop a couple of quid on a skin or two because you're already addicted to their game. The aim of making you a consistent player is to turn you into a whale. Turn you into that 1% player who spends hundreds on the game every single month. Because those are the people that they rely on. Most games with microtransactions heavily rely on whales to make their profits. And there's nothing wrong with being a whale. And there's nothing wrong with companies marketing to the whales either. But when a game does everything that it can to try and fatten you up to make you a whale, and is even willing to turn people into literal gambling addicts for card packs and loot boxes, then I think we've gone a step too far. The idea for this video stemmed from a Reddit post on r slash Hearthstone. I haven't played Hearthstone for a long time. I quit the game quite a while ago for a variety of different reasons, mainly because Blizzard is a scummy company and the game is way too expensive. I haven't come back since I quit. But I still enjoy watching some of the Hearthstone content creators, and I still view the subreddit fairly often. Watching the entire community blow up for the thousandth time this year has been fairly entertaining, but the real gold was this post right here. It's a screenshot of a tweet, and this tweet is absolutely correct. And while scrolling through the comments of this reddit post, I found a link to a video. It's a video called Let's Go Whaling. It's the CEO of a company called Tribe Flame talking about how to monetize a free-to-play mobile game at an industry conference. And holy shit is this the most horrifying video I've ever watched in my life. It's like staring into the abyss. It's like a how to kill the video games industry 101 press conference. The link will be down in the description below for you guys to watch it yourselves and I recommend you do because it's actually mental. Some of the stuff he talks about is just clever marketing stuff. Like this part where he talks about aiming content at certain types of players. The achievers want to progress in the game, the socializers want to speak to other people, the killers just want to uh, compete and kill each other, and the explorers are the guys who are after stories and, and uh, experiences. Developers will market their games to all of these types of people. The achievers are marketed to, with XP boosts and new stuff to level up and stuff like that. The socializers are marketed cosmetics and hats and skins and stuff. The killers are sold on getting a competitive edge. This is where any arguments about pay to win content comes in. Killers want to buy power. Explorers are the ones who want DLC content. They want new maps, they want new storylines, they want new characters and stuff like that. This is super interesting, and there's nothing wrong with any of this. He also mentions that in mobile games in particular, the vast majority of revenue will be in the achievers, the people buying XP boosts. But some of the things he talks about are extremely insidious. To remind you that the best way to make sure of both your retention and your monetization is to make sure you have enough of an in-game economy in there. Uh, the thousand up there is actually clearly lowballing it. Top grossing games have in-game economies worth tens of thousands. We need more gain to offset the loss is felt more strongly. In games you can apply this by giving people stuff that feels is in their pocket and then threaten to take it away unless uh, they pay up. There's a lot more of this sort of thing in this video. If you offer someone a limited time offer, they will feel pressured into buying it. If someone spends money on something, they need instant gratification for it, otherwise they're less likely to spend again. Availability of information affects people's decision making very heavily, so when a player sees lots of people getting rare stuff, they overestimate their own chances of getting rare stuff themselves. This is why in Hearthstone, you have this little notification every time someone on your friends list gets a legendary in a pack. 
and Team Fortress 2 notifies every active player when someone gets a golden frying pan to drop. This right here is where all of the innovation in the gaming industry is going nowadays. They want you to open your wallets regularly, and they want you to throw large quantities at microtransactions when you do. And they want you to get addicted to the act of spending money. This video has been a lot of doom and gloom, so I just want to point out that not all microtransactions are bad, and lots of companies do it very, very well. I hate to give Riot Games credit for anything ever, but their in-game monetization is actually really, really good in all of their games. Let's use League of Legends as an example. League makes its money mostly from cosmetics, and very little of their in-game transactions actually affect gameplay in any way. You can buy champions with money, which affect gameplay, but it's possible to unlock champions for free, and it's fairly easy to do so, so this doesn't really matter very much. The thing that's really good about League's monetization is that you can just buy the skin you want. It's not like Valve games where you buy a chance to buy a chance to get the item you want. You can just buy the skin that you want, it's right there in the client. Sure, there are loot boxes in League of Legends, but they're 100% optional, and I personally have never spent money on loot boxes in League of Legends, whereas I have bought a few skins here and there in my time. They also have champions and skins go on sale all of the time. All of these skins right here are on sale right now, and the stuff that's on sale changes once per week. One thing I don't like though about League's monetization is Riot Points. The reason they use Riot Points is because it obscures the value of your money. £5 gets you 730 RP, but £10 gets you 1460 plus 60, which is more than double. Same goes for the jump to 15, there is a bonus RP tacked on for your money, which not only incentivizes you to spend more at a time, but it also obscures the value of your money. This skin here costs 1350 RP, but how much is that in real world currency? I have no idea, and neither do you, that's the point. It's much easier to fling around fake monopoly money than it is to spend actual real currency. So obscuring the value of what you are paying for helps companies greatly. They also make some stuff cost slightly more RP than you can buy for 5 or £10. Like how £5 gets you 730 RP, but a little legend's egg costs either 750 or 925. This is the same thing as V-Bucks in Fortnite, or when Xbox Live used to have Microsoft points. It's an attempt to obscure your understanding of the value of what you are paying for, in the hopes that you'll be more willing to waste more of your virtual currency. But other than this, I think Riot's microtransactions in their games are very good, and they have kept it up in their other games too. Now if you watched this whole video and found yourself angry at what some companies will do to manipulate you into spending money, Here's my advice to you. If you want things to change, you need to never spend a single penny on something that you think is manipulative, malicious, or addictive in nature. Don't buy loot boxes, especially if there isn't an option to directly buy what you want. Don't buy this scummy battle pass from Blizzard. Only buy a battle pass that is good value for money and doesn't take 10 hours of gameplay a day to level through. Don't buy overpriced skins, don't buy pay to win content, don't spend money on things that are clearly implemented with greed in mind. Because Reddit threads being angry are definitely a good way of rallying the community to action, but the only language these corporations speak is money. If their newly implemented system hurts their monthly profits, then it will be gone in an instant. Thanks for watching.